um, Jorge Soberon. I am going to um, uh, introduce our speaker for today's uh, global online seminar on, on biodiversity informatics, uh, Hannah Owens. Uh, who, she will be very, very soon uh, 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 a PhD from the University of Kansas. And, and she has been working uh, among several other things on uh, phylogenetics and niche modeling combined together and using a very simple uh, system, which is fishes. Uh, I always found amazing that you can do this kind of studies with fish, uh, marine fishes. So um, this is a, the 12th seminar that we have had. Uh, many viewers from all over the world. I really hope you will enjoy this one. It's going to be extremely interesting. And without uh, further ado, as it is uh, often said in, in, in English, I will introduce uh, Hannah Owens. Hannah. Thank you very much for that introduction, Jorge. And uh, thanks to everybody for stopping by and checking out our video today. Um, so let's see if I can get this up and running. Okay. Why is this not? Oh. oh, right. There we go. So the talk that I'm going to give today, as Jorge mentioned, is on uniting niche modeling and comparative phylogenetics to infer codfish biogeographic history. Um, so one of the things that I'm particularly interested in about, bi about with regards to biogeography is the idea that um, a lot of biogeographic patterns are based on allopatric speciation uh, as the result of geographical barriers that isolate populations. Uh, however, uh, these barriers are often tied to environmental gradients and environmental tolerance limits may actually be important drivers for diversification. And so I was interested in uh, investigating how to best incorporate these environmental tolerance limits in an inference of biogeographic history. So I'm going to start my talk this morning with uh, a little bit of an introduction to the system, uh, make, make sure that all of you are familiar with uh, codfishes. Then I'll introduce the problem, talk a little bit about the unresolved questions in the evolution and biogeogra biogeography of codfishes, and then describe the study, basically what I did to resolve the problems and what I found. Um, so we'll start with the introduction. So when I say codfishes, I'm referring to the subfamily Gadanae. These, uh, hmm. apparently that was what was going to happen. Okay, um, so these, Fishes in the subfamily Gadanae are mostly defined by their fin placements. Uh, this is a monophyletic group of fishes, I should say. Uh, so there are three dorsal fins, two anal fins, and the pelvic fins are placed in front of and below the pectoral fins. And most of these fishes also have a single barbel, which is used for sensing when foraging on the seafloor. So a lot of these species are actually benthic. Uh, and these uh, fishes in the subfamily Gadanae are distributed in all of the area that you see in red on this map here. So they're all northern hemisphere. The great majority are benthic and temperate, like Gaddis morua, which is shown here in a nice benthic coral reef habitat. Um, but there are two species that are particularly bizarre, Boreogaddis saida and Arctogaddis glacialis. Um, and these, these are Arctogaddis glacialis is shown here. So these species actually live and forage in gaps in sea ice and are pelagic, uh, which means that since they're living in sea ice, they need to be tolerant of a wide variety of salinities and temperatures. Uh, and we'll get back to this, but uh, first to orient you to uh, the map that I just showed you, since it's a little bit of an odd projection. Uh, this is a map that shows um, that some of the uh, important landmarks in that projection. So Arctic Ocean shown here, uh, Asia is up at the top, Europe, and then Africa, the Mediterranean Sea here along the right, the Atlantic Ocean on the bottom right, North America on the bottom, here's the Canadian Archipelago, which is important for cod fishes, also the Bering Sea, which is another important region, and then the Pacific Ocean out here on the bottom left. 
Um, so with that in mind, uh, all of the codfishes are econo ecologically important uh, and are gape limited predators. So basically this means they will eat anything that fits in their mouth, even if it's a crab shown here. Um, and so what they do, what these species do is when they're small, uh, they eat things like krill and amphipods. As they grow, they move on to larger prey like capelin and herring, and they actually serve as an important trophic link from these lower levels in the food chain up higher to harp, things like harp seals, mink whales, and uh, people as well. So these are species that have been historically fished uh, and were salted and used for trade for hundreds of years. Uh, in modern times, we usually harvest about 5 million tons annually. Uh, and these are often used as food fishes. So for things like fish and chips, and also for uh, things like artificial crab so, or surimi. Um, and in fact, these species are so uh, exploited that overfishing has actually collapsed the Atlantic cod fishery in Canada. And it hasn't recovered yet. And it's very uncertain as to why. Um, but there are also other uncertainties, which is where we get we move on to the problem that I will be discussing in today's talk, uh, which is resolving the biogeographic the biogeographic history of codfishes. So first of all, even though that these species are very economically important and very well studied, there's still disagreement on the relationships among species. So I'm showing you here three different phylogenies that have been generated in recent time. Uh, on the right, on the left, you have Carr and colleagues in 1999. They used two mitochondrial genes. In the middle is uh, a study by Colson and colleagues in 2006. They used the full mitochondrial genome and got a different answer. And then last, Roa, Verone, and Ortiz. So this is part of a much bigger study on all of gadiformes, and they used a mix of mitochondrial and nuclear markers. Um, and you can see just from the densities of the trees that these are sampled at very different densities. Um, and so I'll show you a little example of just how different the topologies are. So Boreogaddis saida is one of those Arctic species that I mentioned that's particularly odd. So Carr and colleagues found it nested within the genus Gaddis. Uh, Colson and colleagues added Arctogaddis glacialis to their phylogeny, and Boreogaddis was pulled out sister to Arctogaddis, and that clade was sister to Gaddis. Um, and then Roa, Verone, and Ortiz and colleagues actually, uh, or Roa, Verone, and Ortiz, I should say, uh, pulled out Boreogaddis saida as being pretty far down the tree relative to the other two studies. Um, and this actually has pretty dramatic effects on biogeographic um, conclusions that one might draw from these phylogenies. So I've now color coded all of the species to show their um, native their native ranges, basically. So dark blue is are the Pacific species. So Gaddis calcogrammus, Gaddis macrocephalus, and Gaddis proximus are all Pacific species. Uh, the species shown in red are Atlantic. Uh, the species shown in sort of a light orange are Atlantic and Arctic combined. So they sort of, Gaddis ogak sort of leaks into the Arctic from the Atlantic. The two light blue, or the, the light blue species are mostly Arctic. So the Sporeogaddis saida, Elaginus nav navaga, and Arctogaddis glacialis, and then the sort of light blue is the same situation as in the Arctic, but in the Pacific, or in the same as in the Atlantic, but in the Pacific. So you have a little bit of leakage into the Arctic. Um, and so you can see that depending on which tree you follow, you might come up with very different conclusions as to the biogeographic history of the species. So in the case of the Carr and colleagues tree, you have approximately four transitions from the Atlantic to the Pacific if we follow a strict parsimony uh, interpretation and that Elaginus might have been a stepping stone from the, or from the Atlantic to the um, Pacific. Uh, and in Colson and colleagues, you might actually conclude that instead of having a temperate Atlantic ancestor, 
uh, this crown group of Gaddis and Arctogaddis and Boreogaddis may have actually had an Arctic ancestor, which is very different and has very different implications. Oops. Um, for the history of the group, and then the same thing with Boreo or with uh, Roa Verona and Orti, you have a very different set of scenarios, and so it's it can be quite difficult to tease apart. Um, what the signals might be is as to the biogeographic history of the species. Um, and so there are two possible scenarios that might have led to these, these patterns of uh, Atlantic and Pacific sister species with some degree of Arcticness sort of thrown in in the transitional species. Uh, so the first scenario is that these groups uh, experienced a speciation pump um, style of uh, pattern. So in this case, during warm periods, sea ice dissipated and connected the Atlantic and Pacific with temperate waters. So you may have had, you know, the sea ice dissipates, species move from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and vice versa as you get, cycl as you get cyclical glaciation. Uh, or you might also have that there was an Arctic radiation, which then dispersed to fill the current distributions of the species. Um, and since the only previous study that Colson and colleagues in 2006 estimated the divergence time of the Arctic group or of the uh, amphiboreal groups, so the species that occupy either a, the sister species that occupy an Atlantic or Pacific distribution, uh, as about five million years ago when Arctic temperatures were not dissimilar from those seen today, we might from that infer that the ancestral species were in fact Arctic and inhabited. Uh, habitats very similar to that of Boreogaddis saida and Arctogaddis glacialis. And as, as I alluded to in the previous slide, the uh, paleoclimatic history of the region has been very, very dynamic. So this top plot uh, shows sort of the paleoclimatic history of the last four million years. So four million years is shown here along the right. And then as you move back along the left, it's it gets to be more recent in time. Um, and what this is showing is that about 4 million years ago, things were quite a bit warmer than today, uh, but began to cool as you approach the Pliocene. And there was this cold snap right here about three and a half million years ago, followed by the mid Piacensian warm period. So this is a period that was much warmer than it is today. Uh, and then as you move further into recent time, you get uh, you get more and more periods of cool weather that may have been periods where uh, glaciation may have blocked passage from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, so sort of these classic ice ages that have come and gone may have limited uh, dispersal back and forth. So you may have had the ancestor of Gaddis in the Atlantic. Uh, you run into one of these warm periods, the sea ice dissipates, that species goes back into the Pacific and then vice versa. Um, so again, with an Arctic radiation, in the case of this amphiboreal distri distributed group, Gaddis, uh, you would have a species that, or you would have rapid Arctic radiation followed by dispersal southward to current distributions. And increased sea ice may have actually served as a bridge from the between the Atlantic and Pacific. So if these species were Arctic and adapted to sea ice, the increase in sea ice may have actually served as a bridge instead of a barrier. Um, and this sort of uh, adaptive radiation model is commonly invoked to explain diversity in the Southern Ocean, but is actually quite rare in the Arctic Ocean. And so that would be a particularly interesting finding. Um, the alternative scenario, again, is that glacial cycle driven vicariance was the dominant model of speciation for amphiboreal fish. Uh, so the ancestor of the clade may have been temperate. Arctic species may have represented a one-way diversification, so a single specialization into Arctic habitats. Uh, and then dispersal across the Arctic Ocean may have only been possible episodically as they tracked temperate climatic conditions back and forth during uh, periods of cooling and warming. Uh, and so this is again called the glacial speciation pump and has not yet been applied in diversification above the species level in gadding fishes. Um, so it's been invoked to explain population level diversification, but again, not above the species level. Um, and so 
the question that then is which, how do I figure out which of these scenarios is more likely? And this is where we get into the actual study. Um, and this is a complex question. It's a climatically dynamic area and time. And so I tried to incorporate a total evidence biogeographic approach that incorporated biogeographic range history with a phylogenetic reconstruction of ecological niche evolution. And so that study ended up following this pattern. So the first step was to do a phylogenetic analysis to resolve some of those conflicts that I showed you in the phylogenetic trees of previous studies. I then developed ecological niche models for each of the species to characterize their ecological niche tolerances and then use that information in an ancestral character state reconstruction. Uh, and then tested the two alternative hypotheses that either the uh, ancestral species in these amphiboreal groups was Arctic or that it was temperate, and then also compared these results to more traditional range re biogeographic range reconstructions. Uh, and using those particular, using those two sets of methods uh, sort of looked to see what we could conclude about the biogeographic history of gaddings. So first, the phylogenetic analysis. Um, so this study imp increased the number of species that were sampled. Uh, and in addition to the mitochondrial genes 12S and site B, uh, also employed the nuclear genes RAG1 and ZIK1 to hopefully get it resolving some of the deeper uh, phylogenetic nodes. And so here's the result. So the most similar uh, phylogeny to the one that we recovered in this study was that of Roa, Verona, and Orti. Um, and so you can see that uh, we've resolved some of the nodes. So the, dark, the black nodes are 100% maximum likelihood bootstrap support. Uh, the gray nodes are 70 to 99%, so somewhat uncertain. And then the 70, the white nodes represent 70% or less maximum likelihood bootstrap support. So those nodes are not very well resolved. Um, and this is a tree estimate shown using Garley for maximum likelihood and Beast for Bayesian inference. Um, so this is based on a strict molecular clock. Uh, and the tree topology is from beast with maximum likelihood scores uh, shown with the dots, like I said. Um, and so this, again, this study got a slightly better resolution by adding an additional nuclear gene or an additional nuclear locus. And the Boreogaddis arctogaddis clade uh, was pulled out sister to gaddis instead of Palachius, uh, which is a result more similar to that of Colson and colleagues. But other than that, uh, this tree is again fairly similar to Roa, Verone, and Orti. Um, and so the next step after that was to develop the ecological niche models for each of the species. And so I did that by collecting locality data from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility database and the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. And these are both uh, really great databases for doing uh, these sorts of large scale ecological niche model studies. Uh, that serve up uh, museum specimen localities as well as observations and uh, another a variety of other sources. Uh, and then I looked and the, the dots shown here are all of the localities of all of the species. Um, and then I filled in some of the gaps. So I had some sampling gaps up here in the Arctic Ocean and a few over here in Russia. And I filled those in with localities from the Zoological Institute at the Russian Academy of Sciences, as well as the British Natural History Museum. Uh, and then cleaned those points and integrated them with environmental data that I derived from the National Snow and Ice Data Center, as well as the National Oceanographic Data Center and uh, some data from the National Center for Atmospheric Research and uh, the National Geophysical Data Center. And so these data were mean, maximum, and minimum, sea ice concentration, temperature at the surface and the bottom, salinity at the surface and the bottom, as well as mixed layer depth and bathymetry. And so I in integrating the locality data with that environmental data using Maxent, I de developed a number of ecological niche models for each of the species. And so I'll go through those right now. Um, so the first little clade down here is Trisopterus. So these are all uh, Eastern Atlantic species. 
and you can see they all have fairly similar distributions. In each of these maps, I should mention the colored area is the calibration region for the model. As the color goes from a light orange to a darker orange, the darker orange shows the higher suitability uh, for the species. And so you can see there are a little bit of differences, but most of these Trisopterus species have a fairly conserved distribution in the Eastern Atlantic. So the next clade is one of our, oh. <laughs> The next clade is one of our clades of interest. So this is uh, Microgaddis tomcod, which is an, a Western Atlantic species, Microgaddis proximus, which is a Pacific species, and then Elaginus gracilis, which is sort of a transitional Pacific to Arctic species. Um, and so this is gonna be one of our groups that's particularly interesting from a biogeographic uh, history perspective. Um, moving up the tree, we have uh, the intermediate Atlantic species, so Micromycisteus putasu, Melanogrammus eaglefinus, and Merlangius merlangus all have fairly similar distributions. Again, uh, this area around England, Ireland, and uh, the Norse countries is particularly uh, favorable habitat for a lot of gadian species. Um, the next is uh, the genus Palachius. So again, you see here a fairly similar distribution and suitable habitat in the Western Atlantic and the Eastern Atlantic. Uh, and then our true Arctic species are two strange little guys. Boreogatus saida is distributed pretty much across the Arctic and down into the Pacific and Atlantic a little bit, whereas Arcticatus glacialis is actually more restricted only to the Arctic uh, and there may even be some competitive exclusion going on here. Ecological studies have suggested that they actually do partition uh, away from each other. And then last are genus Gaddis, which is where we see a lot of the amphiboreal back and forth. Uh, so Gaddis calcogrammus and Gaddis morua are sister species, one's in the Pacific, one's in the Atlantic. Uh, and Gaddis ogak with uh, and Gaddis macrocephalus are also sister species with one mostly in the Atlantic, but you can see that there, there is some suitable habitat down here in Hudson Bay. And then Gaddis macrocephalus out here, mostly in the Bering Sea. And so the next step after I've developed those ecological niche models is to do the ancestral character state reconstruction and hypothesis testing. And so a little bit of background in comparative phylogenetics for those of you that are not as familiar with these methods. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a pretty simple phylogeny showing three species. Um, and the red fish are most closely related to each other. The blue fish is equally related to both, but is more distant to either of the red fish than the two red fish are to each other. Um, so we call those red fish sister species. Um, and so by examining some of the similarities in those sister species, we may actually be able to infer the character state of the most recent common ancestor. Um, so that is, if you know something about the daughter species of that ancestor, you can infer the, char the characteristics. So in this case, the two sister species were, are red, so we might infer based on a basic parsimony model that the most recent common ancestor was also red. And this method of reconstructing ancestral characters can be used to, for ecological niche tolerances as well. Um, but it's, it gets to be a little bit more complicated because instead of using a very simple categorical uh, character state, we're actually dealing with a distribution. Uh, and so this is an idealized uh, picture of what the suitability response of, a particular, of one particular species might be to mean temperature. Um, so it might find that a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius is the most suitable, uh, zero and 20 are the least suitable, but sort of has this nice normal distribution. Um, but the question is, how do you code that when you do a phylogenetic niche reconstruction? And so one method that some studies have used is to use some, some measure of central tendency, so either mean or median. But the problem is that this doesn't account for the tails, which may have more evolutionary significance because the extremes are probably where selection is occurring. Um, 
So other studies have actually tried using the minimum and maximum relative suitability of this curve. Um, since this is, again, where selection occurs, but this doesn't account for the shape of the curve, so you don't know what's going on in relative suitability between the minimum and the maximum. It may be that this value uh, is actually multimodal or uh, could be any number of situations. And so uh, there's a non-parametric iterative reconstruction method that was first discussed in a study by Evans and colleagues in 2009 which, sam which weights uh, samples by suitability. So you have more, sam you have more sampling occurring uh, where the temperature is more suitable and less sampling occurring where the temperature is less suitable. And so this may take into account some of the variability within uh, a species response to temperature, um, but the tolerances of and, and also since species tolerances of climates may not always follow this nice idealized normal distribution. Um, and this is particularly useful in an empirical system like that of GADNE in which you, environmental responses are definitely not parametric, um, as you can see in this. So this is a predicted niche occupancy profile uh, of minimum surface temperature for all of the species in the study. Uh, so each of the curves are uh, coded for the species, um, and then relative suitability is shown along the y-axis. So you can see, for example, Arctogatus glacialis uh, experiences the most suitable temperatures at negative 2.1 degrees centigrade and declines sharply by 0.8. Um, whereas you have more temperate species like uh, Tricepteris minutus that uh, prefers much warmer habitats. Um, and so you can see again how this weighted sampling method may uh, more completely characterize the ecological niche of the species when you do your phylogenetic niche reconstructions. So the next step was to do character state reconstruction, which I did again by incorporating uh, the, pro the predicted niche occupancy profiles with the phylogenetic tree that I generated. Uh, and then I compared these to sort of a null Arctic distribution of environmental variables and a null temperate distribution of environmental variables. Uh, so if the most recent common ancestor reconstructions overlapped with either of these distributions, that would provide evidence that the most recent common ancestor may have existed either in the Arctic or in the, or in temperate, or I should say uh, Arctic environmental habitats or uh, temperate environmental habitats. Um, and so our results, there were only five of the 18 environmental characters that actually had, uh, that were actually phylogenetically significant. And those were mean bottom temperature, maximum bottom temperature, minimum bottom temperature, mean surface temperature, and minimum surface temperature. The red bars are the distribution or the common are the uh, confidence interval of the temperate habitat for CODs in the modern day. And the blue is the distribution of Arctic confidence intervals. Um, and then the thick dotted line is the reconstructed ancestral Tomcod mean so that uh, Microgatus and Elaginus clade. And then the uh, somewhat more spaced out dotted line is the ancestral crown cod mean, so that gaddis plus arctogaddis and boreogaddis. And so you can see that in no case uh, were the reconstructed most recent common ancestors intersecting with the arctic confidence interval, but in two cases they were quite similar to modern day temperate habitats, uh, especially mean surface temperature and minimum surface temperature. And so the next step was to compare those with a traditional biogeographic range reconstruction. And I did this using uh, a new model testing framework that was developed uh, by Nick Motsky called BioGeoBears. Um, and so what this does is it actually compares several different models of biogeographic range evolution. Um, so DIVA, DEC, and Bay Area. This shows a comparison of the different processes by which uh, or that are allowed by the different models. So all three models allow for dispersal, extinction, and narrow sympatry. So where you have, uh, for example, for narrow sympatry, you have an ancestral range that might only uh, exist in one area, but then uh, 
there's cladogenesis and you end up with two species occupying that same area. So that's sort of how to interpret these little plots. Um, Bay Area allows for widespread sympatry, so you can occupy multiple areas and then uh, speciate in sympatry and still occupy multiple areas. Uh, DEC allows for subset sympatry and narrow vicariance, and DIVA allows for narrow vicariance and widespread vicariance. And so this is actually using a maximum likelihood framework to test which of these biogeographic models are the most likely, which can tell us something about the processes that may have led to modern day distributions of fishes. And so uh, I tested a number of these models, including a model that allowed for unconstrained dispersal from the Atlantic to the Pacific. So not forcing the species to travel through the Arctic in order to get there, um, but also uh, a constrained model that only allowed the species to travel through the Arctic. Um, and my results actually showed that the DIVA model was the most likely. So this allows for narrow sympatric speciation and widespread vicariance. And the most likely scenario was one of unconstrained dispersal. So again, that would be, you can potentially disperse from the Atlantic to the Pacific without crossing through the Arctic, or at least not uh, recovering an Arctic um, distribution as a transitional state. And so here the nodes are all uh, coded using uh, the various ranges. So Western Atlantic is shown in dark red, so that would be something like Gaddis Ogak. Uh, Eastern Atlantic is a lighter red. Uh, Arctic is orange. Pacific is a slightly lighter orange. And then you have combinations of each of these four uh, ranges. And so we'll take a look in a little bit greater detail at our two key groups. So first is tomcods. So you have Elaginus gracilis and Microgaddis proximus, sister to each other um, with a Pacific uh, distribution. Their ancestor was Pacific. And uh, their most recent common ancestor with Microgaddis tomcod uh, was a combined Western Atlantic and Pacific distribution. Um, so parapatric speciation may have occurred in the Pacific with Elaginus being a little more Arctic, uh, but likely allopatric speciation happened for the Atlantic clade versus the, uh, West, or for the Western Atlantic clade versus the two Pacific species. Uh, and then the range reconstruction for the crown cods, we have the two Arctic species up here. Of course, their most recent common ancestor was also Arctic, but this particularly interesting ancestor uh, between the Arctic species and our amphiboreal species in Gaddis uh, was recovered as a combination of Arctic and Pacific. And so this is sort of a transitional uh, range that sort of occupied a little bit of both of these uh, ranges. And so based on all of that information, what can we conclude? Well, um, in order to place this in a little bit greater context, I actually uh, took my ultrametric Bayesian inference tree, so that tree that I showed you earlier, and then calibrated it using an experimentally determined rate of evolution for site B, as well as six fossils in the gadine clade. Um, so the error bars that you see here at each of the nodes show the 95% confidence interval on the age of the group. Um, and I've highlighted the various uh, paleo, uh, ER, um, so I've highlighted the Holocene, the Pleistocene, the Pliocene, the Miocene, the Oligocene, the Eocene, and the Paleocene. So going back 70 million years before present. Uh, and then the blue bars shown at the bottom are generally agreed upon dates for key paleoclimatic events. So the Eocene hyperthermals, which I didn't even show you earlier because they occurred so long ago, the mid-Miocene warm period, so that's that time where the uh, Arctic was quite a bit warmer than it was today. Uh, and then periodic Arctic sea ice began to form around 10 million years ago. Permanent Arctic sea ice uh, was probably formed uh, by about two and a half million years ago. And then between two and a half million years and the present, we had our rapid glaciation cycles. Um, and so if we take a look at our two key groups, for Tom Cod, we had an ancestral niche that was temperate and a range that was Western Atlantic and Pacific. And so this may suggest that there was a speciation pump involved, although the nodes, as you can see here, um, most likely 
the two the species began to diverge before you had the rapid glaciation cycles and so there was probably something else going on at the time that may have led to the diversification of these species however with top with our crown cods which are quite a bit more recent uh, you again have ancestral niches that were temperate and arranged that was arctopacific and the uh, age of the nodes coincides with the formation of periodic arctic sea ice followed by permanent arctic sea ice and rapid glaciation cycles and so this is a little bit of a stronger signal that uh, glaciation cycles may have played a fairly strong role in the diversification of this group of crown cods um, now there are a couple of caveats here the first is uh, that the uh, ecological niche models only estimate the uh, realized fund or the realized niche of a species and not its fundamental niche uh, and so we may not have we probably didn't characterize the full uh, range of suitable habitat for each of these species especially for Arctogatus glacialis um, because if you extrapolate from this line you might expect uh, as temperature gets colder it would be infinitely more suitable, which is not at all a likely scenario. And so some possible solutions include uh, mechanistic modeling of physiology for these species, but also um, Dan Warren talked a couple of uh, seminars ago about possibly inferring the fundamental niche from uh, the phylogeny actually. And so that could be a potentially interesting uh, solution. And the second caveat is that uh, a lot of these nits, one of the key assumptions in ancestral character state reconstruction is that characters are independent. And niche characters are almost certainly not independent. So this graph shown here is an example um, of large coastal largemouth bass. So you have salinity along this axis, temperature along this axis, and oxygen consumption as a function of salinity and temperature. And so this would suggest that, again, these niche characteristics are not um, independent. And so uh, to assume otherwise is uh, perhaps a bit naive. And uh, as far as possible solutions as this, for this goes, um, this is a really challenging question, not just for ecological niche, but also more broadly in phylogenetics. And so there's quite a bit more room to uh, work on resolving this question, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how folks choose to deal with it. Um, and so for future work in this particular system, uh, I'm really interested in some of these computational solutions to the two caveats I just mentioned. Um, I'm also working to develop appropriate paleoclimatic data layers to uh, project the most recent common ancestor into the paleoclimate um, to actually get a much more specific model of the possible biogeographic history of the group. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge Pete Hosner, Arpi Nayari, Mike Anderson, Matt Davis, the KU Ecological Niche Modeling Working Group, and KU Ichthyology for all of their help and insight. Uh, this work was funded by an NSF DDIG grant, a KU NSF Igert Sea Change uh, Fellowship, as well as the KU Biodiversity Institute and the KU Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, as well as an International Biogeogra Biogeog eh, Biogeographic Society Student Travel Award. And with that, I will take any questions. So we'll go back to, oops, that's good. I don't want to. Um, stop it here. Yeah, I don't want to stop it. Do you don't? No, because we're still talking. Um, Ah, so there we go. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, we have the group chat going along the side here. Um, I may begin with, uh, with a very general question, Hannah. Mm -hmm. If you may, while we wait for some other people to participate. Um, you're dealing with a very difficult problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, um, well, are there uh, similar studies in the literature already dealing with uh, this uh, this attempt to reconstruct uh, the ecological niches of species in such a deep past? Um, I can't really speak to the time period. I know that there are a lot of other studies that have been done sort of doing these ecological niche reconstructions. So I mentioned uh, Evans and colleagues in 2009, but there's also um, 
I think the, the Donahue lab has worked on this a little bit in plants, as well as um, Catherine Graham and colleagues worked on this problem in frogs and uh, a few others, um, some birds have, they've attempted to do these phylogenetic niche reconstructions, but um, sort of incorporating the time element and sort of the biogeographic range reconstructions and all of that is really complicated. And so I think there's still a lot to be done. Do you think that niches are conserved, fundamental niches, that they are very sort of slow, slowly changing and inherited in, in lines? I think it's a useful hypothesis to start out with. Um, I don't think that that's always going to be the case, um, especially considering that we have this strange group of Arctic get cods, for example. Um, that quite clearly there may have been a mutation and maybe a one of the antifreeze proteins in their blood that allowed them to take advantage of these habitats. And so I think it's probably some combination of gradualist and saltationist evolution in ecological niche. Clearly, if a lineage invents something like an antifreezing pro mm -hmm. protein, that is going to open a very yep. large chunk of yep. environmental. Uh, you said something that caught my attention. Uh, well, several things, but one was that uh, your your analysis is consistent with an in, unconstrained dispersal for mm -hmm. that means that that is a what we call a Hutchinson world <laughs> where everything is available yeah um yes but part of the reason that I think I came up with an unconstrained answer was because these things were happening on such a quick time scale and I don't have a whole lot of fossil evidence to show what actually happened between the Atlantic and the Pacific. So there's no way that, you know, aliens came down, grabbed species from the Atlantic and just dumped them in the Pacific. They had to get from one to the other somehow. And given the geography of the region, that most likely happened through the Arctic. And so just because it wasn't recovered in the biogeographic range reconstruction doesn't mean that that isn't actually what happened. It just happened so quickly that the reconstruction didn't recover that particular answer. It's interesting to have a real case situation documented with evidence in favor of a Hutchinson world <laughs> because, uh, well, as you know, that means that uh, it's one of the easiest uh, uh, situations for niche modeling. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I was lucky in the system I chose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we're not yet getting any, any other uh, questions or comments, so I'm going to ask another one. Okay. Um, one of the criticisms that people make of niche modeling all the time, and it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a valid criticism, is that we ignore interactions mm -hmm. between species, well, among right. sets of species. How important do you think this is in your case? Um, so I've tried to convince myself that it's not terribly important. Um, at, Realistically, at some point, interactions are going to play a role. I did mention, for example, that there may be competitive exclusion between the Boreogaddis and the Arctogaddis species. Um, however, in that particular case, you actually have them partitioning by uh, depth. So Boreogaddis tends to occur lower in the water column and Arctogaddis tends to occur higher in the water column. Um, and so you don't end up recovering as much of a problem since the way I did my ecological niche models, I did them in two dimensions. So I just looked straight down at, in geographic space. Now, um, Bastian Bentelage has a study on uh, jellyfishes that he actually did in three dimensions. And so if I were employing his methods, I might be a little more skeptical that I had completely uh, modeled Arctogaddis and Boreogaddis appropriately. Um, but especially for species like gadines that are very generalist and basically will eat anything that fits in their mouth and uh, you know tend not to have a whole lot of competition with other species other than themselves and they will even eat their own. Yeah. Um, I don't really think that it's as much of a problem. Uh, I can definitely see how in some cases the microecological interactions would play a role, but I think as long as you are very careful about learning the ecology of your system, uh, you might be 
be able to incorporate some of those issues or try to work around them. And of course, you are working at a coarse resolution. Right. right. Yes, I am working at a very coarse resolution. All of these, all of these environmental variables were at a one degree resolution, since that's really the the resolution that's the most realistic for the ocean because it's a big place. Sure. <laughs> the, the environmental data comes from um, actual instruments at many, many thousands of them, or, or, or there are interpolations of just a few? So it's, uh, it's a combination of them. So NOAA has this World Ocean Atlas data set that's based on uh, measurements that are taken on cruises, and you can actually see the map of all the cruise routes, and then from that they do interpolation to come up with a smooth response surface. Okay, well eventually we're probably at the dawn of an age of embedded instruments all over. Yeah. And uh, we're yeah. going to be flooded with data. Yeah, it's going to be really exciting and fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, I still don't see any any comments coming or questions. So maybe what we should uh, do is um, hope that many of you will be watching this uh, later in the day when it's more convenient according to your time zone or whatever and please send emails to the to the account of, of professor peterson and we will uh, hannah will try to to answer as many as, as it is uh, possible uh hannah thank you very much that was a very interesting talk thank you jorge and thank to all of you for for watching this uh this uh global um seminar bye bye <laughs>